We know that our Lord Jesus Christ, more than anything, is interested in the salvation of souls. And that his passion and death are for souls to open up uh, a, a new covenant, you might say, right? A new covenant with all men. And as a sign of this, in the beginning of Passion Week, there are some Greeks that come to the feast. And these Greeks approach Philip and say to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip tells Andrew, and then Philip and Andrew together go to Jesus. And our Lord responds and says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So often in his public life, he would say, My hour has not yet come. Well, now the hour has come. And our Lord says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. One of the preconditions of carrying out apostolate is detachment. In fact, our father would say that whenever we want to set, whenever we set out on an apostolic journey, whenever we set out on an apostolic mission, no matter how large or small it might seem, it's very good at the beginning, at the outset, to take stock of our talents, of our gifts, of our time, of all of our means, of all the things that we think are important, and that we put them all in the hands of God. Why? So that then we can adopt the means that are necessary, or we can adopt the means that are useful in order to carry out what God wants us to do. Our Lord only needed the cross in the end to save, to bring about the redemption. And he asked us to be his cooperators. And as we pray about the cross, We can pray about how even at the beginning of the cross, even from the cross, we start to see the salvation of souls being worked out, the good thief. Our Lord gives Mary to the church. Our Lord prays from the cross for souls. He prays that prayer from the cross. My Lord, my Lord, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But he also prays, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he also prays, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Our Lord, in the middle of the suffering of the cross, he's united to the will of the Father. And he's winning the salvation of souls. And from the cross and from all of the growth that we can see of the church since the time of the cross, we see being realized those words of the prophet Isaiah.
For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not thither, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It will accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Lord, we thank you because we know that we're agents of your word. We know that you're giving us grace in order, and we're thank you, we thank you for that, uh, the great grace, the, the great confidence that we can have in your grace, bearing fruit. The Holy Spirit inspires Isaiah to say, you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into song. The mountains and the hills are the difficulties that, that our imagination proposes to us in carrying out the apostolate. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of thorns, there will be cypress. Instead of briar, will come up myrtle. Our Lord is giving us great hope. The Holy Spirit is giving us great hope. His words will not be frustrated. <clears throat> there are stories of some saints who would, in difficult moments, they would preach to the fish. <laughs> As a way of, first of all, it's very biblical, because our Lord will, told, tells the apostles, you know, from here on out, you're not going to catch fish, you're going to catch souls. And this was a sign of their confidence. Their confidence that the word of the Lord cannot be frustrated. One of the gifts that were given as the result of our faith and as the result of our struggle and our prayer is the gift of understanding, the gift of wisdom. And of course, we're told that <clears throat> whoever has wisdom, the one who possesses wisdom, loves wisdom more than health or beauty. I would choose to have wisdom rather than light because the radiance of wisdom never ceases. All good things come to me along with her. Wisdom is the mother of all things. It's an unfailing treasure for men. Those who obtain wisdom obtain friendship with God. And then we're told that wisdom is one. Wisdom can do all things. She can renew all things. <clears throat> and in every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God. Lord, again, we thank you for this promise that you give us. That in every generation, you pass into holy souls and make them friends of God. We thank you for making us your friends. And we also ask that you give us this confidence. Right? Give us this confidence that 
Well, that we can, because you communicate wisdom to us in our life of prayer, your words cannot be frustrated. Your words will not return to you without bearing fruit. Give us confidence to set out in the apostolate. And of course, from time to time, our Lord gives us little indications. He permits little indications that are a reminder to us that our apostolate is worthwhile and that it bears fruit. There was a young man came to a center here in Boston from a foreign country, met the work. I think he met the work. He had first converted to Catholicism, <clears throat> but then met the work that whistled as a supernumerary. And was finishing up his degree, his, his wife, he, he was married. He and his wife had one child. And he got on the subway to go from Harvard Square to who knows where. And I guess it was later at night, so the subway was not as full. And there was a lady on the subway and she was kind of, something was wrong with this lady. And so as she spoke, she kind of shrieked and spoke at the same time. <clears throat> and she kind of looked at him and sized him up. I started telling him things about himself, <laughs> like where he was from, what city he was from, and what foreign country. And then she told him that she knew he was married and that they were trying to have a second child and that they would have it. They would succeed. And they, she's, his wife is now pregnant with their second child. And then the shrieker told this fellow that your wife will convert to Catholicism. And of course, she's coming into the church this Easter. And then the shrieker told him, and you are part of something that is raising up a generation of champions for Christ. So that's the third. That's the third promise. That's the third secret of the subway apparition. <laughs> Lord, we thank you because every, every once in a while we receive these little indications. These little indications that remind us that well, that our efforts are worth it, <clears throat> that we do bear fruit, that maybe sometimes our efforts that apparently don't bear fruit, well, sometimes that, that act of the will, that good intention, offering up the apparent failure, I mean, sometimes that itself is winning grace for souls somewhere. If nothing else, it's helping us to grow in humility. And of course, when, when in our families or in the, in the church, when we're experiencing difficulties, those difficulties also are occasions of grace. Lord, help us to understand how difficulties and apparent failure are occasions of grace. Our Father 
would sometimes pray the Te Deum after receiving bad news. <laughs> he was, of course, he would say it after receiving good news, but he would also sometimes pray the Te Deum after receiving bad news or apparent bad news, bad news in the eyes of the world. Why? Because he understood that grace doesn't always work the way that it seems to work to our eyes. A good act of reparation, a good act of love sorrow, made after some apparent defeat or failure, is sometimes precisely the grace that our Lord needs. It's precisely the cooperation that our Lord is asking of us. We see this. <clears throat> and, and, and failure also is not, it, it's, a, it's not, or apparent failure, of course, it's not a reason to give up. We see this in the, in the example that our Lord tells of the fig tree, <clears throat> where the master wants the fruit from the fig tree, and the fig tree is barren. And the steward who takes care of the vineyard, he goes to the master and he says, give me one more year. Right? Give me one more chance. And then if it doesn't bear fruit, then we can take, you know, then we can do what needs to be done with it. But let's, let's give it a one more shot. These times when our Lord approaches the apostles when they're in the boat, on the day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them, just as he was in the boat, And other boats were with him. And the fathers of the church, they all see that this, this is the image of the church. The boat is the image of the church. The apostles are in the boat. In this instance, our Lord is with them in the boat. And he's apparently asleep on the cushion. And the great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat seems to be filling. And they wake him up, and they say, Teacher, don't you care if we perish? He rebukes the wind. And he says to the sea, peace, be still. And in another instance, when they're on the boat, right, and they come to a, our Lord comes to them on the water, as, he, as he's walking towards them on the water, he will say to them, ego sum, I am. Don't be afraid, I am. Take heart, it is I. Take heart. Now, that some scripture scholars point out here that the second time when they're in the boat and there's the wind and the waves and it's the fourth watch of the night, they're even scared of our Lord when he approaches, right? <clears throat> but they point out that what these scripture scholars point out, and some of, this, some of us learned this in Christology this summer, this past year, that... When, if we go back to the burning bush, when Moses asks God at the burning bush, well, who should I tell the people that sent me to them? And God says, tell them, I am sent you. Tell them, ego sum sent you. And when our Lord approaches the apostles in the boat, 
He says, take heart, ego sum. This is one of his claims to divinity. This is one of the moments where he's revealing himself as God. Lord, we ask you, as we are in the storms, the wind and the waves of life, and we ask you, as the church is in the winds and the waves of the world, and the winds and waves of history, and we especially ask you in these times, these little bit more difficult times. They're more difficult times for us in our families, because why? Well, Christian society is crumbling around us, right? And that puts a certain strain on life. It makes things difficult. It also makes it difficult that the church is as we meditated on in the first meditation on the retreat, as our Father said, and as the Father himself has said in the letters, in the the last monthly letter, that, yeah, we're in a time of confusion that's different than, but no less difficult than, that period in the 70s that so much hurt our Father. Lord, we ask you to wake up. (laughs) Help us to listen to your words here. Take heart. It is I. Have no fear. Help us to engrave these words in our hearts. Help us to keep the joy and optimism that you kept during your passion and death because you knew that unless, and because as you tell the apostles that a grain of wheat must fall into the earth, it must die in order to bear much fruit. Lord, help us to ingrain in our hearts also what you tell the apostles. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. Right after this happens, our Lord reiterates that he has precisely come into the world for this hour so as to glorify the name of the Father. And then we have an an incredible moment, right? The Father, a voice comes from heaven and says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And Jesus says, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Because now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. In 1884, you know, this, this is one of those things where it's mystical. And we don't know exactly what it means, but... We all know, maybe we know the story, that in 1884, on October 13th, 1884, Pope Leo XIII had an incredible vision after Mass. And in that vision, he kind of he saw that, well, the devil would wreak havoc on the church for 100 years. And so after that vision, he composed two prayers to St. Michael. One is a shorter prayer, which he ordered to be said after Mass every day. And when they, when they rescinded that order in the late 60s, early 70s, our Father encouraged all of us, to, as part of our personal piety, to say that prayer to St. Michael the Archangel every day after Mass, right? to continue saying it. And the Pope has recently encouraged everybody to start saying this prayer again. And the Father has been also reminding us to say this prayer to St. Michael. Why? So that we can get back to what some people are now calling, so we can get back to the old evangelization. (laughs) In other words, so we can carry out the mission of the church in the world, like the first Christians, with their same spirit, in different, different circumstances, but the same spirit. 
proud of our Catholic identity, proud of being Christians. And yes, showing people the beauty of the Christian way of life, of the beauty of, and the goodness and the truth, all of them, not just one. Right? But the goodness and the beauty of the truth of following in the footsteps of Christ. Christ, who is the creator of the universe, who is the creator of human nature, and who, as we have seen, wants to draw all men to himself. Mary, queen of apostles, obtain for us this grace, this grace to be, well, to be protagonist in raising up lovers of wisdom and raising up friends of God and raising up champions for Christ in our generation. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.